A Glasgow man has been jailed for attempted robbery after he ran into a shop waving a sword and was chased out by a woman armed with a plastic fork. Danish firefighters have used a battering ram to break into a house and rescue a man who'd become trapped in his own height-adjustable desk. A woman in Houston in Texas with 26-inch long fingernails has said she hopes to break the world record. It currently stands at 28 feet, four and a half inches. And the deputy leader of South Lanarkshire Council, who oversaw the closure of all public toilets in the area, has been fined for urinating in the street. Welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as the News coming to you from up the creek in Greenwich, London. My name is Dan Schreiber and I am sitting here with Anna Chizinski, Andrew Hunter-Murray and James Harkin. <laughs> Once again, we are here to present to you the most interesting stories we found in the news of the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you. Andrew Hunter-Murray. My fact is that before he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond was a used car salesman. <laughs> immediately before he was Chancellor <laughs> of the Exchequer. <laughs> no, not immediately before. It was, a lot, it was, a, it was uh, some years before he became uh, the second most important politician in the country. Uh, so he, he, After Nigel Farage. Sorry, third. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a load of uh, business schemes as a young man. He was really entrepreneurial and he set up loads of companies and things. And one of them was uh, buying and selling uh, Ford cars from the Dagenham plant, which I think makes him a used car salesman. Um, um, and he did a load of things. He, he ran discos for teenagers. Um, he tried really? to... Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. That oh. was when he was a teenager, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't... It didn't oh, go okay. <laughs> he was a goth, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, um, according to Richard, Richard Madeley. Madeley. <laughs> yeah. He, he went to school with Richard Madeley of uh, Richard and Judy fame, of course, and someone asked Richard Madeley what he was like, and he said he was a goth, he wore a long trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the, Times, the Times researched this, and they said, in fact, Mr Hammond left Shenfield Technical High School seven years before the popularity of the goth look. So... Uh, so he was a trendsetter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, um, Philip Hammond is in the news this week because it's the Autumn Statement, which is kind of like a budget light, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the mini-me. Yeah. To the Dr. Evil of the main budget. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we got some pictures uh, in from the Treasury uh, to show how amazingly dynamic it is um, what they're doing there at the moment. Yeah. So, this is Philip Hammond. There he is. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> What I would say of these pictures is they appear to me to be pictures of a cop <laughs> with an, an incidental chancellor in the background. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a, uh, an article all about him in the FT soon after he was made chancellor, and they reported he has such a sobering public image that he is often referred to as an accountant despite having no accounting <laughs> qualifications. <laughs> Which is tough. Yeah. And a colleague of his allegedly once suggested going for a drink, and he just replied, why? <laughs> <laughs> The idea that he was a used car salesman, um, I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, a lot of these MPs must have had jobs prior to being an MP. So Amber Rudd, for example, she worked on Four Weddings and a Funeral, the movie. She? Yeah, she helped get uh, extras for the movie. Um, she was credited as aristocracy coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> So, How far she's come. Yeah. <laughs> but, so the only other person that I could see that had a genuine movie credit, and it was a thanks credit, was George Osborne. Okay. And he has a thank you credit in The Force Awakens, the Star Wars movie. <laughs> For inspiring the mood of evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he, I think he provided uh, a kind of tax cut to international <laughs> filmmakers, and so Disney and Lucasfilms were like, thanks, buddy. <laughs> and, and they filmed it over here as a result. Um, so in the Autumn Statement, this is a thing... So the Autumn Statement is like the micro-budget, basically, and I don't know if the Chancellor can do this during the Autumn Statement, but during the budget, there's one thing that the Chancellor can do that no-one else can ever do in the House of Commons, which is drink alcohol. You're allowed to for some reason, because you're going to be talking for ages, basically. All the recent chancellors have been completely lame. So that George Osborne, Alistair Darling, Gordon Brown, they all drank mineral water. Oh. Boring. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Clark had whiskey. And then if you go a bit further back, Benjamin Disraeli had brandy. And Gladstone had this weird bottle, right? No one knew what was in it. Uh, and people kept saying, what's in the bottle? And it turned out it was sherry and beaten egg. And that was his thing for his budgets. Yeah, but he did 12 budgets, so that's... Yeah, broke. but what were they like? <laughs> you know what they were like? They were long. So the longest ever uninterrupted budget speech was uh, William Gladstone, which was four hours and 45 minutes. Whoa. Uninterrupted. <laughs> uninterrupted. Oh my God. And they're not scintillating at the best <laughs> of time. <laughs> no. So if we leave the EU, we'll be able to drink champagne in pints again. What? Something that we... <laughs> <laughs> like you ever stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I've been having to do it on the sly, uh, yeah. under my coat. Um, so this is Paul Roger, who makes champagne. They've said that they're going to bring that back as soon as they're allowed to when we leave. And it was uh, Churchill's favourite champagne provider. It was Queen Victoria's favourite, I think. And it was Churchill's favourite amount because he said, half a bottle is insufficient to tease my brains, but an imperial pint is the ideal size for a man like me. It's enough for two at lunch and one at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> So, obviously, uh, the autumn statement has been delivered, and we now know that uh, the internet broadband speed of Britain is going to be brought right up, and they're going to spend a billion pounds on uh, gold standard, they call it, broadband. So there's a place called uh, Miserden, which has the lowest in the country, and it's insane. They have a speed, a top speed of 1.30 megabits per second. And the lowest, so they, just to put that into context, Mount no, no, Everest... No, no, we all know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> if you're at base camp at Mount Everest, you can get two megabits per second. <laughs> well, you're a lot higher up there, aren't you? You can, like... <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah. But on the moon, you can get 20 megabits per second. What? Yeah. The lowest that you get in Miserdin is 0.12 megabits per second, and someone tried to download a James Bond movie and it took five days. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what that means? That means that if you wanted to get it quicker, in theory, you could go take a plane to Kazakhstan <laughs> and fly to the moon, which takes three days, land and download that Bond movie. <laughs> faster than you could have done in Missouri. <laughs> in theory, that's missing out, like, years of training to be an <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So, Hammond's got in a bit of trouble with his fellow Cabinet members for being slightly negative about Brexit, would you say? Yeah. Uh, he said there's... What did he say? He said... We're all gonna die! <laughs> <laughs> flee! Flee to your second homes in Monaco, fellow Tories! <laughs> <laughs> I think he said there was going to be a £100 billion hole in the, in the mm -hmm. budget. Um, and I just thought I'd look at some of the other things that have been affected by Brexit. So, uh, Marmite, there's been uh, problems with Marmite, hasn't there? Um, and another bit of Marmite news this week is that Marmite's chief taster has retired. Ooh. Okay. Revealing he actually hated it all this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been doing the job for 42 years. Um, he <laughs> says he's sampled the equivalent of 264 million jars. OK. And he says, now that he's retired, even though I won't eat it every day, I still will eat Marmite when I feel like it, which is quite often. <laughs> <laughs> OK. It's time to move on to our second fact of the show, and that is Anna Chizinski. Yes, my fact this week is that Oxford Dictionary's word of the year is actually two words, post-truth. Only seven out of their 13 words of the year have, in fact, been one word. Oh. Yeah. So is... Even the dictionary's lying to us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the news this week that possibly you saw that, yep, word of the year is post-truth, and it's a reference to the fact that um, truth doesn't exist anymore. And <laughs> so this, yeah, so they've had a word of the year going since 2004, and their words of the year since 2004 have been big society, I'll remember that, uh, squeezed middle. Um, their first one was carbon footprint. They've also had credit crunch. And then they had simples and omni shambles, <laughs> selfie, vape. And then last year, of course, it was the face with tears of joy emoji 
which you might remember, mm. which we couldn't actually afford to get a picture of. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could tell you how I feel about that. <laughs> I think they're just, I guess they're obviously just trying to represent what the mood of the country in particular is. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, Collins's um, word of this year is Brexit. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, they said it was first recorded in 2013 and has increased by more than 3,400% this year. Which is the inflation rate next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they said that it's even more useful word than Watergate. <laughs> um, because of all the different types of new words for Brexit, like uh, Bremain, Brimorse, uh, Brex Pitt, for when Brad Pitt split up with Angelina. <laughs> <laughs> um, no one used it. Not no. a single person used it. Um, so, wow. do you know when is the first use of the word post-truth? Ooh. So, it came in a US presidential scandal. Uh, it was the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, where Ronald Reagan denied that the US was trading guns for hostages. Uh, it was a thing with Hezbollah in Iran. And it was, even though all the American people kind of knew he might have been lying, they didn't really care because the outcome was more important than the truth. Mm. OK. Um, but a lot of what's come in um, this week is fake news may be affecting the US elections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a study uh, done in June by Columbia University and the French National Institute, and this is very interesting. So it's about the way that uh, fake news spreads online. And they found out that 59% of links that people share uh, on social media have never been clicked on, right? Uh, yeah, so okay. people are more willing to share an article than they are to read the article before they uh, share it. So stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Newspapers are now having to deny that certain newspapers exist. So the <laughs> Denver Post recently, in the last couple of weeks, had to write an article, the headline of which was, the Denver Guardian is not a real newspaper. Please stop believing it. Because the Denver Guardian was... The, it was the newspaper, the, the newspaper that published on Facebook the story that an FBI agent who was suspected in the Hillary email leaks had been found dead in his apartment. So lots of people shared that, and that wasn't true. The Baltimore City paper has had to run a piece saying the Baltimore Gazette has an existed since the 1860s. Please stop <laughs> reading stuff on there. But it is... Because all the articles are way out of date. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, and it has been a problem. So BuzzFeed was the one that did this big expose on it a couple of weeks ago, and they found that the top 20 fake news stories in the three months up to the election had 8.7 million shares or reactions or whatever it's called, and then <laughs> the top 20 real news stories had only had 7.4 million, so fake news stories were getting more shares wow. and reactions than real news stories. But a lot of people are, are spreading fake news or doing it not in a manipulative way. They just think it's genuinely news. The New York Times did a story on a guy called uh, Mr. Tucker. We have his tweet here. This is what he sent out, that anti-Trump protesters in Austin today are not as organic as they seem. Here are the buses they came in. And so he took this photo, he saw all these buses. Now, it turned out that he was walking by and he saw these buses and he thought, oh, this is happening near where the protests are. I wonder if this is to do with the protests. So he thought, I'll do a quick Google. And he said he couldn't find that there were any conferences in the area. There was. <laughs> there was one with 13,000 people at this conference, and it was called the Tableau Software Conference, and that's what those buses were for. And so this guy just sent it out, and it went viral and got picked up by major news outlets. And he was really apologetic, because he didn't know. He knew at the back of his mind there might be another explanation, but he said, I'm also a very busy businessman, and I don't have time to fact-check everything I put out there. <laughs> 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 we need to move on to our next fact very soon. Anything before we do? Just what you were saying about uh, dictionaries really reflecting the changing times and the most important social movements and things like that. In Australia, uh, the Australian National Dictionary, they added uh, a whole raft of new uh, words to the dictionary in August, and they were uh, quite relevant because there were a lot of, for example, Aborigine words which hadn't been in the dictionary before, and there were also a few other terms. They got a bit more colloquial, so they added happy as a bastard on Father's Day. <laughs> Also added my personal favourite, dry as a dead dingo's donger. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're halfway through the show, and it's time to look at the stories that you've sent in to us via emails and social media. Starting with you, Anna. 
Uh, yeah, this came from Joshua Cowie on Twitter, and it's from The Age in Australia. It's the Australian police investigating a break-in at a community hall in Wodonga, dusted for fingerprints, but found only a bum print on the glass door. He <laughs> <laughs> could have had two huge fingers. <laughs> James? OK, mine is from Angelina on Twitter, and it is that scientists have identified the genes linked to uncombable hair syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, uh, that was sent to your direct account, wasn't it? <laughs> Apparently, only 100 cases of it have been documented since 1973. Oh. Wow. I am now a medical curiosity. <laughs> Uh, and finally, Andy, your facts? Yes, uh, this was sent in by JC, and it's from UPI. And it is that American police are currently looking for a man known as the Spelling Bee Bandit, who <laughs> has robbed several banks by wearing sunglasses and then handing a note to the teller which says, this is a robbery. <laughs> 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 OK, it is time to move on to fact number three, and that is James. OK, my fact this week is that this week a satellite was launched that carries the most advanced weather predicting system in history. It should have gone up three weeks ago, but was delayed due to unforeseen weather <laughs> Uh, this is absolutely incredible. It's a thing called GOZAR. Uh, it's the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, and it is going to make weather forecasts better overnight. Literally overnight, all weather forecasts will get better. The way that it scans things is ten times better. It can scan half the Earth every 15 minutes, and the moment we can only do half the Earth every three hours. Uh, and whenever there's any severe weather, it's going to be able to go right in there and scan it every 30 seconds, which we just can't do at the moment. So it's going to give us real-time weather, and it it might be able to save lives because we'll be able to give people a bit more time whenever there's tornadoes or hurricanes or anything like that. It's just one of the most incredible science stories. I, I heard a comparison, which is that it's if you imagine the current system that we have is like watching a black and white movie with you know no sounds and all those cards. This is a Blu-ray DVD. If it's a Blu-ray DVD, do you mean it's going to be supplanted by superior technology within about six months? <laughs> <laughs> when is the Netflix satellite coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first thing that got me excited about it was the fact that it's going to be able to steer planes away from turbulence. So it's able to measure the um, waves within clouds. It beams images through clouds and then sees what waves are inside them, and then it can tell aeroplanes to avoid turbulence, which is great news for yeah, horses. Yeah. So the weather event which stopped the original um, satellite from going up was Hurricane Matthew. We have a picture of it. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> that is a picture of Hurricane Matthew. If we can take pictures like that, I'm not sure we need this satellite. <laughs> 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 um, oh, this is a cool thing. So there was footage uh, and pictures this week of the clean room, which is what they call the completely pristine environment they have to keep the satellite in before it goes up. Get this, some of the instruments on it are so sensitive that the contamination limit for them, even after 15 years orbiting, there can't be a single layer of molecules on the surface of the instruments, otherwise they won't work anymore. Wow. So that's how clean they had to keep it before sending it up. But wait, when it goes up, won't stuff get on it? I think they keep the stuff off it while they send it up. OK. I mean, I hope they thought that through, cos if it breaks so onto something, <laughs> start, that's embarrassing. Well, it turns out they just strapped it to the top of the rocket and it's completely <laughs> disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know one embarrassing thing that could happen to all satellites is the Kessler effect, oh, yeah. which is when two bits of detritus in space collide, they break into little pieces, and then those pieces crash into other things in space, and they break into little pieces, and it's like a chain reaction effect. But we are in danger of that. Uh, we're in danger of it particularly because China tested an anti-satellite device in 2007 just to check that its anti-satellite devices worked. It told us after it had sent it up, said, by the way, we're about to explode one of our satellites. <laughs> oh, there it goes. And that <laughs> broke up into hundreds of thousands of little pieces which are still rotating around the earth and we have to track all of them so there are all these sort of bits of detritus all around the world which are spinning around and they could crash into each other so we have to monitor them carefully yeah. but if they do that will block out space from everyone you're, you're not allowed to poo in space that's one of the reasons why because... yeah what they go up for weeks and weeks oh no no yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you yeah, just yeah. take i think it's emodium <laughs> <laughs> But they had to stop it because genuinely poo was going around the planet and going around, and if that collided with a satellite, that could smash well, it into okay. a lot of bits. I've got a video of. Uh... Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. The video 
<laughs> created by uh, the US Naval Research Laboratory, and it's the cloud of debris from uh, disintegrating satellites. So it's going around Is normally. That a poo? It's, let's say it's a poo, fine. And then, <laughs> boom, it hits something. Whoa. This is the area which could be contaminated by debris. Wow. I know, and it goes, and then we go a few more rotations, and then I think we'll cut to a bit later. Yeah. Oh. Whoa. I know. It looks really nice, though, doesn't it? <laughs> we need to move on very shortly. Okay. Can I just show you, because this, this fact is uh, initially about weather, and something that's happened in weather news this week is there's been a lot of flooding, and so I was looking into ways that we can stop the damage of flooding, and we have a video of this amazing product, a UK company called Tarmac, uh, which is where the name is not a coincidence, that's where the name <laughs> Tarmac comes from, created this thing called Top Mix, which is permeable concrete. So here it is. Where is the water going? Whoa! <laughs> what is happening to it? It just sucks up the water. And um, so it's able to drink a thousand litres of water per square metre in one minute. No and way. So if we use that, then all our water just disappears down into the tarmac. We're all fine. It has drawbacks, like it's a bit weaker than normal tarmac. And um, if you drop your drink. <laughs> <laughs> Do you normally scoop your drink? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you should see me in car parks. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it is time to move on to our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that as part of the Buckingham Palace refurbishment, the Queen will start using her leftover food to power her boilers. <laughs> Does that mean she has to choose between being too cold or too hungry? <laughs> so this is the fact that this week they've decided that they're going to renovate uh, Buckingham Palace. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? That's Why right. Uh, it's going to cost £369 million. Um, and... Oh, builders these days. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll be the quote only, you know. <laughs> it's going to take 10 years, and it's a huge list, because 78 bathrooms are going to be replaced, 100 miles of cabling, 6,005 electrical sockets, 5,000 light fittings, 330 fuse boxes, 20 miles of skirting board, 20 miles of heating pipe work. There's a lot to do. <laughs> 20 it's... miles of skirting board? <laughs> <laughs> that would um... take you 20 miles all the way to Windsor Castle. Would it? Yeah, skirting board all the way to Windsor Castle. Why didn't she do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, the fact that the Queen is managing to heat her house with her leftover food, so yes. this is an anaerobic digestion unit, isn't it? And this is in the plans for the Buckingham Palace refurb. It says they're going to build an anaerobic digestion unit, and what that does is it, it breaks down organic matter, so food in this case, although it can be sewage and things like that, but I couldn't, for the life of me, find any evidence that they were going to use the Queen's sewage <laughs> to power the house. The um... Queen doesn't make any sewage. <laughs> <laughs> You're both going to have your heads chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> It's a reaction that happens without oxygen that uh, produces a biogas, which is 60% methane and 40% carbon dioxide, and then that can be burned and it heats the house, so it heats the boiler. So that's how it heats Buckingham Palace. All the staff who work there live there as well. So it's got, uh, let's see, it's got a cash point, uh, it's got a post office, it's got a cinema, it's got a helipad, and the other thing it has is got a store of soda water and blotting paper for when the corgis pee on the floor. <laughs> no. I've read a couple of accounts which say they just have the run of the place. They, really? They can pee where they like, basically. Oh, right. She wants to get this concrete everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, um, it is dire, in dire need of repairs. It's always hot, so the radiators don't operate individually and most of the knobs on them have broken. And so there are rooms in Buckingham Palace that are never entered, but always <laughs> very hot. <laughs> also, it's not very efficient. They did this big survey on it and it topped the list, this was a few years ago, of the most environmentally damaging building in London. Actually, in Lon they said it was the least energy efficient home in the whole of the UK. Wow. I've got a thermal image of okay. how much heat comes Whoa. out, so that's how much is escaping. You can see those super hot rooms on the left-hand side, can't you? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. <laughs> this group said that effectively for London, it's a central heating radiator. It gives off so much heat. She has to switch bedrooms for this move. So uh, the compromise, this is a compromise, essentially. So it could have been that they moved out the whole royal family and they did this refurbishment in a much shorter amount of time, or that they didn't move them out and they did it in a longer amount of time and they've gone for the latter, but the Queen does have to move out of her bedroom which I would be kicking up a royal fuss about. <laughs> Another building which is quite energy inefficient yep. is Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Really? OK. So Trump Tower has an energy use intensity score of 216, 
okay? And any score over 206 places the building in the 90th percentile of the worst pollution emitters of any multifamily residential building. Good thing global warming isn't real, really. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Trump, there's a lot of talk about the fact that he must, at some point, visit the Queen. Is, is the Queen mm. going to extend an invitation and that Trump's mother was a big fan of the Queen and... Uh, <laughs> huge! <laughs> huge! <laughs> Great Queen. <Yeah>. Great Queen. <laughs> One of the best queens. <laughs> so his mother really liked the queen. And um, so I was looking into, because Obama visited uh, the queen, and apparently the detail that uh, the queen goes into making sure that they have an amazing trip, Obama and Michelle Obama apparently reported that when they got there, even to the detail of the toilet paper that they prefer in terms of thickness, Texture, Where colour. have they written that down? <laughs> <laughs> Plowing through his speeches. Yeah. He must have said it at some point. Can we go back to that picture a second? Because that is, are they at a key party? Are they about to go home with each other's spouses? <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris Phillip looks very happy about it. <laughs> we do need to wrap up okay. in a second. Oh, I have one Can thing. So there's there's a uh, another building that's going to be renovated soon is the Houses of Parliament, and the, the repairs for that are going to be huge. They're going to be billions of pounds because it's an enormous building, and so there have been loads of proposals for it. Some people have suggested this thing, which is a massive floating bubble on the surface Ooh, of the Thames. Wow. Amazing. Uh, what or, instead of the Houses of Parliament? Well, they said that's a temporary thing and then once you've finished you can sort of uh, oh, unmoor it and it floats away to other democracies which is <laughs> <laughs> that's genuinely, that's genuinely what we have to think so. <laughs> but um so if you look at that picture you see the big ben tower yeah at the other end of the house of parliament is a thing called the victoria tower okay and i didn't know what was in there but in there they have every act of parliament okay and they have it all written uh, on vellum, which is calf skin, yeah. because it keeps for hundreds and hundreds of years. The longest scroll is uh, from 1721, and it's a tax act, and it is longer than the Houses of Parliament itself. Oh. Wow. wow! If you unrolled it. Is that yeah. what Gladstone was reading out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just on this refurbishment? So they have decided now where MPs are going to live, I think, and sadly it's not in the futuristic bubble. <laughs> uh, they're actually just going to have to move to the Department of Health, which is Richmond House. And Richmond House is leased in this Islamic bond scheme. It's just like one of the deals of how, how the property is leased. And because it's leased in an Islamic bond scheme, anything that happens there forbids the sale of alcohol. So all MPs for six years are going to live in a place that forbids the sale of alcohol. Now, they live in a place now that has 10 bars <laughs> and <laughs> restaurants. And they did, when they realised this might be the case, uh, they proposed that they uh, nationalise the Red Lion pub, which <laughs> The pub that they all go to, they said, OK, let's make sure the Red Lion pub is ours. And the Red Lion pub's owners of Fuller's Inns have said, no, sorry, we're all <laughs> members of the public. Wow. <laughs> OK, that is it. That is all of our facts. Just time to share with you some of the stories that we didn't have time to get to during this show. And we're going to start with you, James. OK, mine is that this week, the favourite to become next president of France announced that he was not Hillary Clinton. Uh, his lead in the polls subsequently plummeted, and he ended up coming second. <laughs> no way. Andy? This is uh, that people in an online charity auction have bid up to £500 for a signed pair of Jeremy Corbyn's old shoes. <laughs> <laughs> there's a left one, and then there's a far left one. <laughs> Um, OK, that's it. That's all from me, Andy, James and Anna. We'll be back again next week. This has been No Such Thing as the News. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>and headline of the week from metro woman entered by a horse spirit gallops on all fours and makes hooves from pots good night bye bye